Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Staying Young at Heart. Our show today is My Brain Made Me Do It. And um, well, I'm your host, Maria Mera, and I'm also a financial advisor with Edward Jones. So today I'm taking a little bit of advantage of that. And um, the reason why we are having uh, the show today, My Brain Made Me Do It, is because we like to explore um, how to stay healthy, how to stay emotionally healthy, financially healthy, physically healthy, uh, mentally healthy. So we are exploring today how to uh, check, uh, have our brains in check. And um, I invited my guest, uh, Christopher Bertorelli. Christopher works as a uh, vice president, regional vice president of one of the best mutual funds in the US, uh, John Hancock. So Christopher, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, for Maria, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, uh, thank you for, for uh, allowing us to hear this. Uh, uh, I know John Hancock has done a lot of research uh, into this matter. So tell us a little bit more on, on uh, what are you exploring and what are you trying to, to find out? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I've been in the business since 1993 and I've been through three really bad bear markets and a number of corrections. And you know, people continually make the same mistakes over and over again. So we've done some research to try to identify pe why people do uh, or make decisions that in retrospect they regret. I mean, we we all know we're supposed to buy low and sell high, right? You yeah. Know, that's it's it's simple, but it's not easy, right? Because when yeah. the market goes down when we're all supposed to be programmed to buy, there's not a lot of great news out there. And especially now, right, that we've had a really tough year. Uh, the virus, the, uh, the elections, the, everybody's, I, I, I think, a little bit anxious and a little bit emotional about your decisions with everything and especially uh, your investments. So that's, that's what I want to explore with you, if you can help us identify um, that those, how to, how to keep that brain in check. Oh yeah. We'd be happy to. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and I, uh, I forgot to tell that you've been working for John Hancock for 13 years, but, uh, also right before you were working for another one of the, I, I understand is the, uh, the oldest mutual fund, right? MFS. Yes, it is. Yeah. So you're you're a, you're the right person to help us here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do my best today. I'll do my best. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, tell us how how do we make decisions? How I I heard something the other day that it say they were saying ninety five percent of the times uh, humans do um, take take decisions with emotions, but then they justify them uh, with logic. It, it does. That resonate with you? Or? Oh, yes, for sure, for sure. Um, it's like when people buy automobiles, right? You know, they, they mm -hmm. buy on emotion and then they justify it with facts afterwards to justify that emotional purchase. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> know, it's, it's, it. <laughs> it's, it's the way, you know, the way we make decisions, there's two ways we do it. There's e they're either intuitive or reflective. And so intuitive decisions are just snap judgments. And that's okay if I'm just trying to pick a shirt that I'm going to wear today. I mean, it's it's not a big deal because the consequences aren't great. It's just a shirt. I mean, the people I'm with might decide they like it or not like it, but at the end of the day, it's not a it's not a critical decision that is going to have a major impact on my future. Um, when we make important decisions, we should make those reflectively. When we make a reflective decision, we take our time, we do some mm -hmm. analysis, we we weigh the different options. And so when we make important decisions, we really should make those decisions reflectively. But sadly, when we're under pressure and stress, when we're nervous, so think about, you know, the market's going down and maybe you get your statement and you look at, you know, what your <laughs> account was worth the previous quarter and what it's worth now. And mm -hmm. you're seeing all this bad news on, on the TV and you're reading bad stuff in the newspaper and on the internet and that type of thing. You start to get anxious and we... We um, are influenced by biases, emotional and cognitive biases. And so how, how do we identify those biases? Tell us one bias that you, that you can identify. Um, so, yeah. So I would say like, 
probably my my favorite bias is because and it is probably because everybody can uh, relate to it as loss aversion. I mean, people don't like to lose, right? Um, uh, but the psychological impact of a loss can be twice as powerful as the impact of a gain. And they actually test this. So they have test subjects and they give them a series of options. So one option might be, you know, uh, if I have this coin in my hand and I flip it and it comes up heads, you win $200. But if it comes up tails, you lose a hundred. Now that's a pretty good bet because you have a 50% chance of winning. And if you win, you'll win twice as much as you lose. But studies show most people won't take that bet. So now you might be thinking, well, why is that such a big deal, right? Well, the reason is it's because loss aversion leads to poor investment choices, specifically investing too conservatively given our time horizon. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, see, keep going, please. I, well, mm -hmm. I was going to ask, so um, you're saying, would that be also like gambling or is are we making a difference between investing and or or is a general thing no it's just a general thing it's just um the, the, that example i gave you with the coin is just an example of um uh, a test that they use to to gauge people's uh ability uh to take the chance at a loss that's all that is but it does okay. give you a sense that you know, a 50-50 bet and where you could potentially win twice as much as you lose and most people will not take that bet gives you a sense for the fact that, you know, most of us are loss averse. You know, we, we strongly uh, prefer avoiding losses over acquiring gains. And, and like I said, the, the challenge is it leads to poor investment choices, specifically investing too conservatively given your, your time horizon and, and when we are feeling this, this sense of loss aversion, office, oftentimes instead of making our next choice being reflective, it's, it's, um, it's intuitive. It's like a snap judgment, which, which is not, you know, not a good way to invest for sure. So how do, how, do I, how do I identify if I'm under the influence of that loss aversion? How, do, how can I identify that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So basically, if you find yourself saying or thinking something like this, right? I'll give you a couple of examples. So if you find yourself saying or thinking something like, I can't sell now, it's down too far, it'll come back eventually. This speaks to investors' tendency to hold on to bad investments too long. I mean, the reality is we have a diversified portfolio for a reason. We mm -hmm. understand that not all of those investments are good. Um, and it's important to recognize when, okay, this one didn't work out. Don't beat yourself up, but you know, it might be time to sell that and move on to something that might be better. Um, and people, you know, they, they just don't want to admit they made a mistake and they don't want to lock, lock in the loss. Uh, conversely, it's funny, investors tend to sell good investments too quickly. So they invest in something that's actually of high quality and it starts to go up. Uh, and then their reaction is to sell it because they don't want it to go down and they don't want to lose the gain that they've been able to acquire. Um, something else, if you find yourself thinking or saying, uh, I don't mind staying in cash, the markets have been crazy lately, I'd rather be safe. You know, clearly, if you're thinking or saying something like that, you're, you, you know, you're under the influence of loss aversion. Um, and sadly, a lot of people do that after the market's already gone down. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. So what, what do I do about it? If I, if I recognize that I, I'm under the influence of loss aversion and um, how, how do I go about it? Yeah, you know, you know, that's a great question. I love that question because it, it's really critically important. Um, I think it's easy to, to, to identify whether or not you're under the influence of the bias, but the critical thing is, okay, now what do we do about it? I'd say the first thing to do is just don't be prepared for market volatility, just expect it, uh, embrace it. It, you know, it comes with the territory. If you're gonna invest in stocks, the, mar you know, the market's gonna go down. I've been in the business for 27 years and I've seen three really bad bear markets and a number of different corrections. And you know, that's not gonna stop. I mean, that's gonna continue to happen. I don't know when and I don't know how much, um, but it'll continue to happen. now. I think it's easier for people to embrace 
um, volatility and the fact that the market will go down if we if we dive into the subject a little bit more. So I've got some statistics I want to share with you today. So a bear market's when the market goes down 20% or more. So when I say the market, I'm talking about you know the S&P 500, which is an index of the 500 largest companies in the United States. So when the market goes down 20% or more, that's a bear market. So if we go back to World War II, there's been 12 bear markets. They last on average about 14 months and the market goes down about 28%. And so you might be thinking, wow, why would I ever subject a portion of my capital to being down potentially as much as 28%? And I'm, I'm actually sitting here telling you to just expect that that's gonna happen. And I don't know when and I don't yeah. know how much, right? Well, it's, it's sort of like, um, I, at, at least uh, to my clients, I usually tell them it's, it's, it's more like a four year cycle, right? Like three good years, one bad year. You never know when that year is gonna happen, but sooner or later, I'm gonna be right and we're gonna have a bad year, so. That's right, and this year. when that bad year happens, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's gonna happen. But like, you, you know, it's interesting, you said, you know, one bad year, you know, three, four good years, one bad year. Well, let's talk about those good years. I mean, if we go back to, to World War II, there's been 13 bull markets, the market goes up, on average for 55 months, so that's over four years, and the market goes up 132% on average. So that's more than enough to make up for the fact that a portion of your capital went down about 30%. 30%. So um, tell us, we have loss aversion, tell us another bias, give us another example. Sure, yeah, we can cover, how about anchoring? I like anchoring a lot because you know anchoring is really important for us. Uh, it allows us to concentrate and focus, right? And so when we have okay. a task that's really complex and we need to really concentrate um, to come up with a solution, you know, it's really important. The, the problem with anchoring though is if we anchor too much on one thing. So if we, if we take one factor and believe it's gonna have an outsized influence on how, we, what, what an outcome is like, then that's, you know, then that's a problem. So, you know, you look at, you know, you know, like in the 70s, we had a really bad bear market. The market went down like 47%. And the 70s was a pretty tough time. I was born in 67, I remember that. And, you know, we had the end of the Vietnam War that didn't go well. We had a president that was forced to resign. Uh, we had an oil embargo. You can only buy fuel um, every other day based on the last digit on your license plate. So. It wasn't a great in, uh, environment for our economy. And we had a, a, a condition that economists call stagflation. So stagnant growth and very high inflation. Unemployment was really high. If you wanted to get a, a mortgage for your house, it was like the rate was like 14, 15, 16%. And the market, like I said, it went down 47%. If you just focused on that drop, yeah. you might ne never invest in equities Again, but you know, yeah. over that period since 1974, you know the market has done phenomenally well, and and so you know clearly. So is that is that kind of what you think we will look at when we look at March of 2020? That will be like, wow, that was a drop, but at the end of the at the end of the day, uh, looking at a 30-year picture, it will be just another bump. Yeah, without question. I mean, a lot of people look at the the decade of the 2000s, right? So that people call that the lost decade. Um, you know, we had the tech wreck, the market went down 48% peak to trough. And then the financial crisis, the market went down 56% peak to trough. Uh, but that was a, actually a great opportunity to buy, right? Buy low, sell high. When the market goes down, yeah. we don't try to time the market. You just rebalance your account just to make sure it's still consistent with, with your risk tolerance and time horizon. Um, and that actually represented a phenomenal opportunity uh, for long-term investors to, yeah. to, to experience gains in the stock market. I, I think it's kind of what happened this year too. So uh, that's a great example. So again, tell me, how, how do I know, how do I recognize I'm, I'm being influenced? My, my brain is taking me to that anchoring. Yeah, so I think if you find yourself thinking or saying something like, you know, I'm still down 10%. I just want to get back to where I started. So there, you're just, you're basically anchored on a dollar amount and you're not thinking about what's really important. What's really important is, you know, what, what is your financial goal and are you getting closer to that goal? So we, 
we recognize, you know, um, when, when you do a financial plan, which is really important, something like the financial foundation, the five-step process that they have at Edward Jones, which is phenomenal, you basically mm -hmm. identify what your goals are and you, and you set a rate of return. You, you identify a rate of return that's going to be necessary in order for you to reach your financial goal. But you're not going to get that number every year. Sometimes you're going to get more than that. Sometimes you're going to get less, right? So we, yeah. in, in a, just a snapshot in time, if you looked at, at a part of your portfolio, look, hey, I'm still down 10%. I just want to get back to where I started. You're really not really focusing on what's really important. And that's, are you, are you still on track to reach your goals? Or six months ago, I had X and now I have half that amount. Again, you're not focusing on your goal, which is the most important thing. You're really focused on a percentage or a dollar amount. So how, how, what do we do about it? Just try to, um, is there any, any, any advice for us if we recognize Oh yeah, that? for sure. Yeah. Um, I would say there's, there's really, you know, the big things you want to do is you want to keep an open mind and seek out some information to give you perspective and change your anchors. And I, and I can give you one example um, that covers all three of those. So, um, and this is really should be fresh in everyone's mind, right? So earlier in the year, you know, COVID was something new and we're all trying to kind of wrap our brains around what the impact was going to be not, you know, on our health and our family's health and our friends and, and then the economy, right? And so we saw the market. I mean, it, it peaked on Mar uh, February 19th and then it dropped. It dropped uh, 32%. Uh, from February 19th to March 23rd. And that's a really big drop in a very short period of time. And so a lot of people were anchoring on, you know, COVID-19, the coronavirus and the impact it was going to have on the economy. So people panicked and they sold their investments. And so they were really anchored on that one factor, but they weren't considering that there were outside factors that could also influence the outcome and the, you know, the big factors that influence the outcome and a big reason why the market is but it's sitting like new highs, it seems like every day, the market's up, you know, over 50% since the trough. And that's the government's response. So uh, there was a fiscal and monetary response by the government, which is really massive, massive and unprecedented at scale. So you have monetary policy, that is the Federal Reserve, that's Jay Powell, and they he controls um, monetary policy, which is basically he tries to influence interest rates. So if they think the interest, the economy is going to slow down, they try to influence interest rates. So there are lower, so it makes it cheaper for us to borrow. So it's easier for us to buy cars and houses and borrow money to re remodel our homes and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. and so they did that. And then they also created some liquidity facilities that significantly lowered anxiety in the bond market. So though, and that was really big. And then you had the fiscal response that's Congress and the president that's, that's spending. And uh, they passed the CARES Act, which is like $3.3 trillion uh, fiscal stimulus. Uh, and if you add it all up, it's equivalent to about 44% of our nation's GDP, which is a huge shot in the arm. And so, yeah, I mean, COVID's a big thing, no question about it from a, from, for, certainly from a health perspective, but from yeah. we're, we're more talking about the economy and portfolios and things like that, but certainly from a economic perspective, but then you've got this other, you know, the government's response was so massive. This is a big reason why the market rebounded so quick. And sadly, a lot of people, you know, were, were caught off guard because they, they didn't, they didn't change their anchor. They didn't try to uh, broaden their perspective and, and, and understand that there could be more factors that, that are going to influence the outcome. That's a big reason why it's so, it's so hard to time the market. A lot of people are tempted yeah. to time the market. They think they can. And I've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's very, very difficult. I think yeah. most people are better off just, you know, have a diversified portfolio that matches your risk tolerance and time horizon. When the market goes down, you just rebounce and try to add to it. It's, it's, you know, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's it's kind of like I know. Weight, it's right? a, so. yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's it's very definitely very long term focus on, on good quality, right? Like anything, focus on good quality long term and, and definitely diversification just to 
um, just to emphasize what you're what you're saying. Um, but I, I know there is so much, but I, I would like to maybe can, can you give us one more example of another bias and uh, just just for those who are probably relating and saying yes to everything that you're saying. Oh, yeah, sure. So I would say another one of my favorites is uh, status quo bias, and that's uh, people's tendency not to change an established behavior unless the incentive to change is compelling, right? It's, it's easier to do nothing. We, we, we don't like change and we're creatures of routine, right? And so um, that can be a, uh, definitely can be a problem, right? Um, so, so, so again, I'm, I'm just gonna keep asking you the same questions, but so how do I, how do I identify that, I, that I'm under the influence of uh, hindsight bias? Okay, so hindsight bias, here we go. Okay, so if you find yourself thinking or saying something like, I don't care what happens next, I'm moving to cash until things calm down, or the market's done great this year. I knew I should have invested more. If you find yourself thinking or saying something like that, clearly, you know, you're you're kind of kicking yourself because you're not really happy with the decision that you made, right? So it's, a, it's just regrets. Exactly. It's kind of, a, okay. So one more time, how do I, how, what do I do if I, if I identify that I have? You know, I think, I have that? I think the the most important thing to do is, you know, don't beat yourself up. Um, regrets about the past and fear of the future are the thief of today, right? Eleanor Roosevelt <laughs> said that in the 50s. And I really believe that's really relevant when we talk about investing. You know, we're human. We're, we're going to be influenced by biases. It's going to cause us to make decisions that maybe in, re in retrospect we regret. Um, but it's important not to waste the day, right? Accept mm -hmm. the fact that was not a great decision. Let's try not to make those decisions uh, again, and let's put together a plan today that's going to increase the likelihood that we reach our financial goals. So I, I overate last night. I had ice cream. Yes, start your diet. <laughs> right, start, start your diet the following day. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, okay. So I mean. Um, Chris, you have covered so much, and uh, and and every I I hope people understand that every one of your sentence is so rich with information and and uh, things that we can reflect. And um, what are there for our viewers and our audience? Just give us uh, some key uh, takeaways that we can take of all your your of all our conversation today. All right, great. Yeah, I've got a few things here that I would just. One, I, I really think you should try to take with you if you want to get something out of this presentation and, and benefit from it. I mean, I think the first thing is, and I, I think if you want to increase the likelihood that you reach your financial goals and you're protected from any type of financial emergency, you'll do a financial plan. Edward Jones has a great one, the financial foundation of the five-step process. Um, it, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really critical. Um, that's going to increase the likelihood that you reach your financial goals. And if you don't have a financial plan, you really should... Uh, you really should should get one, and, and you and you should try not to procrastinate. You should get it as soon as you can, as, you, as soon as you can. Um, if you know you're the type of person that gets nervous when markets are volatile, you can establish some steps to take when you're in a crisis, when you're not in a crisis, right? So if I know that I'm the type that gets nervous when the market goes down, maybe ahead of time I decide, well, you know what, market goes down 10%, I'm going to reevaluate what my risk tolerance and time horizon is. Or uh, maybe it goes down 20%. I'm going to rebalance my account uh, and make sure that my allocation is still appropriate given my risk tolerance and time horizon. Just something to give you um, the feeling of a little bit more control when, when there are a wide variety of factors that are making you nervous that you can't control. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't talk a lot about this, but dollar cost averaging programs are really great. So a dollar cost averaging program is when you invest the same amount on the same day every month. You can do it monthly, you can do it quarterly, you can do it annually, whatever it is. 
But the benefit of a dollar cost averaging program is when the market goes down, you just buy more shares at a lower price, right? Buy low, sell mm -hmm. high. So if you have a retirement plan at work, that's what you're doing. Your employer is deducting capital from your paycheck uh, every pay period. And typically that capital is invested in mutual funds. And when the, when the price goes down, you're just buying more shares at a lower price. And that keys on two biases we didn't really talk too much about, but um, status quo bias and um, procrastination bias. So we, we don't like change. And even if we decide that we should change, we typically will uh, procrastinate. And so what's great about these dollar cost averaging programs, uh, if you have it established before the market goes down, because you, you prefer the status quo, you're probably not gonna shut it off. And then even after the market goes down so much that you're really frustrated and you're really starting to get nervous, you decide, hey, I'm gonna shut this thing off. You'll probably procrastinate and not do it. And by the time you get, you get down to it, the market will rebound and you'll forget all about it. So that would say that. Um, expect that your portfolio will go down at times. That's the other thing. We talked about that early in the presentation, just kind of, you know, Embracing volatility is really important. There's going to be multiple bear markets and corrections in our lifetime. We don't know when and we don't know how much, um, but you know it's going to happen. And as long as we don't panic, as long as we just try to add money to our account and rebalance it, we should be fine. And the, and the great thing about having a financial plan is that it's kind of baked into the plan that there's going to be multiple bear markets and corrections. I mentioned earlier, when you do a plan, you, you establish what your goals are, and your financial planner, they know how much capital you have and how much you can save. And they can calculate what type of rate of return is required in order for you to reach your financial goal. And so maybe it's 6%. And so your investments are not going to earn 6% every year. Some years are going to earn 12% and some years are going to earn zero. As long as you average 6%, you should be fine. And so even if the market goes down, your portfolio goes down, more often than not, if you revisit your financial plan, you'll find that you're still on track. If it's a good financial plan, you should, should still be on track to reach your goals, even though your account may be worth less than it was the previous quarter when you looked at it. Okay, then, but, Chris, but, we're gonna, we, okay, we, we have like one minute to okay. just, uh, um, one more that you want to say, or I think we're giving so much information that, uh, uh, I think our viewers are getting the picture, but if you want to say one more thing or, or um, yes, I think we are running out of time. I guess my, my problem is I like the sound of my own voice. I think that's the problem. So I do apologize. I, I tend to, to run on there, but uh, I think I've, I've shared a lot of stuff. And um, if anybody has any questions, they can just follow them through you and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thank you very much for your time, your hindsight, your saying your knowledge. I, uh, I really appreciate it, Chris, and I know how valuable it is. So I really uh, thank you very much. And uh, to all our viewers, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, keep watching Staying Young Ahar, and we will um, bring guests as uh, knowledgeable as Chris. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Mele Kalikimaka. Uh, Merry Christmas, Chris. Thank you for joining us again. Mele Kalikimaka. Aloha.